military history, we have uh, people come in that are like, combat veterans. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Rambo, but Rambo is a fictional character about a, like special forces. If you guys have seen Yellowstone, anybody follow that the, the series Yellowstone? You guys trying to build a casino? The bodyguard he got is ex special forces. Uh, if you guys, I know this is in a military history class, but um, I know the standing took my military history class. Um, there is an elite group of army called Special Forces, and there's an elite group of Special Operations Forces in the Navy called Navy SEALs. Okay? And so I have SEALs come in and speak to the class, and uh, Joe's Special Forces. And has anybody seen the movie 12 Strong? That's it. 12 Strong is. Um, we watched a lot of that in my military history class. 12 Strong is about ODA or Operation Detachment Alpha 595 rolling in to help this guy in the movie, this guy in real life. Uh, Northern Alliance fight the Taliban. Uh, ODA 574 rolls in and helps this guy who later becomes a president uh, to help fight the Taliban. Uh, special Forces were in, uh, came out in 1952, Colonel Air Bank, and they were in the Vietnam War. And uh, they're just, elite warriors that we spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on training and what they do is they basically go out and they whoop ass and uh, their primary responsibility a lot a lot of times people don't recognize this is they link up generally so their uh, difference between seals and special forces uh, seals are typically younger maybe 22 21, 22 years old, 23. The special forces are generally a little bit older. Uh, a lot of them have degrees. And um, on top of being very good at combat, uh, they have to pick up on languages. They have to be really street smart. And so like if they're in Vietnam, they have to understand the culture. Like uh, how do they eat? How do they dress? In Afghanistan, how do they eat? How do they dress? Um, what are they, what, you know, what is something in common? We need to kill Taliban. Can we do for you to help you help us locate them so we can kill Taliban? And so, anyways, um, this is a special force, uh, Sergeant First Class Joe Lowry, and he is one of the elite of the elite of the U.S. Army. Um, he was deployed in Afghanistan in 2011 and 2014 as part of ODA 7232, um, right here. And he was part of the special uh, seven special forces group. I was going to ask him just a couple of questions to explain to you. If you took me for military history, you would understand there's only a few people like him out there. There's not many. There's a lot of people that try to be special forces and they drop out because of how difficult training is. And we're talking about people that are elite athletes that already know the attrition rate. And as they roll in, they're going to drop out of the training. Um, we watch a video in my class called Two Weeks of Hell. Since then, it's three weeks of hell. Uh, SEALs, there's something called Hell Week that we watch. And anybody in my military class, I mean, I haven't seen anybody that would raise their hand and go, I can make it through the three weeks of hell, or I can make it through Hell Week in the Navy SEALs. And, and then after that, they do crazy stuff like SEER training, which if I explained to you what SEER training was, you probably wouldn't believe me, or some of you in here would think that it's not humane or like we're actually doing that to our own soldiers. But you have to train these guys to be the best of the best of the best of the best in the world. And so, um, anyways, um, in 2014, Sergeant First Class uh, Joe Lowry was actually deployed in Afghanistan. And the date, I forget the exact date. July 7th, 7th, I think. 17. Okay. I mean, and then can numbers. you walk us through really quick? Not important, but somewhere around there. What happened on that day? Because you got, I don't know, it's obvious that something happened. He's a Purple Heart recipient. Purple Heart recipients are people that have been injured, like big time injury in no, combat. It's any injury. I mean, you could have a small gunshot wound and, you know, to your pinky and still get the same Purple Heart that I got for taking a round to my head. Yeah. So it's like, like my buddy, he lost a leg and an arm, and he got a purple heart. So it was like, no. Can you can you walk through? So on that day, 
you guys got called in. So your ODA 70, 7232. 7232. So an ODA or an Operational Detachment Alpha is um, a group that consists of how many men? 12. 12. And on that 12 strong. Yeah, so the movie 12 Strong was about that ODA 595 that goes in. It's 12 of them. And they basically are calling in airstrikes on Taliban. So you got 12 versus many. Well, here's the thing now. I was going to interject earlier, yeah. but the best term we can use for that we are the special forces soldier is a force multiplier. So one ODA equals the yeah, partner for force, we train a battalion size element. So the battalion's about a thousand, correct? Yeah. And I mean, that's weird. That's why they call us, and that's why JFK loved the Green Berets. He's like, they're force multipliers. You send in a small amount of guys, and you get this big product. Um, Especially in cases like Afghanistan, that's a perfect scenario to use special forces. What happened on that day? Do you remember? Oh, yeah. So we were going on a mission to engage with some enemy, you know, just enemy in the village, and they were had been attacking U.S. forces or convoys that would come through that village. So they were like, hey, we're going in there to pick a fight. It's the best way I could put it. I mean, of course, it's not what they wrote on the op order, but essentially, that's what we were doing. And it just started as soon as we got in the village. I mean, we left ODAR 30. I remember that morning checking my nods, night vision, optics, and making sure they're working. And we're out there in the morning, crack of dawn, like this morning, 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> To get on the California freeways, yeah. not that's mixing two stories, yeah. but same thing. Yeah. Checking the night vision, weapons, everything's good, and we go out and go into the village. We're getting there on time and everything. And sure enough, as soon as we pull into that village, rounds start cracking off. It's like, they call it a tick, troops in contact is called up, meaning like all assets are pushed there, and they're just like a command is focused on that area. And you guys are the first ones in? And what did you, were, you, you went in in vehicles, correct? Well, I yeah, that mine, the Mat B is a mine resistant, resistant vehicle, so they have the V-shaped holes are really high off the ground. Right. And so we started taking contact. And what was your position? I was inside? on the top of the truck. And not like a Humvee, they're way the hell up there. I mean, they're like 16 foot tall vehicles, so. So, uh, so I think, I'm not sure if they all know what a, a M240, I have an M240, but if you guys have seen an M60, it looks similar to an M240. How many of you guys can picture an M240? It's not up here. Scar right there. Yeah, but you said, you told me that you had the Scar Long and yeah. a, and a uh, 240. Scar Heavy. Which one was this Scar Heavy? It's the 762 version. Okay, so which one of these, I forgot, which one looks more like the one you the had? The one on the bottom. Okay, so you had one of these, it's a Scar Heavy. Not all black that murdered out like yeah. that, though, in the pan. Like that, like that color, yeah. Exactly. And so you had that, you had a uh, M240. Uh, that was you... attached to the truck. Okay, so is was, was that called coaxial? Uh, yeah, panel mount. Oh, yeah, coaxial. So you, so, so, you had, so you had that, and you're firing. The M240 is a fully automatic. Belt fed machine gun. Belt fed machine gun. And then the SCAR is magazine, and that's a 7.62. Is it semi automatic or automatic? Semi automatic. Semi automatic. So as you're going through, I think you, you told the last class that you said something like, oh, shit's about to get real or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that was my last con with my medic who was from you to me on the top of the truck. Him and I were both senior guys on the team now. Uh -huh. So it was like, we're, we're going to go up in the hardest positions, you know, with the most possibility for Kidding. insults. So, so you're up and you're next to the, the medic and you guys are engaged in a firefight. And uh, how do you, so this is, this, is my, this is not a military history class. So the, they haven't heard the guest speakers come in and tell you how you know a round is close to you. How do you know that you are, you know, you hear shooting, but how do you know that there's a round close to you? They start to crack, uh -huh. like make a very audible, like cracking sound. As it goes by you? Yeah, because if they're, you just hear the gun firing if it's far and yeah. you hear like whoosh, whizzing sound. But when they're cracking off next to your ear, you're like, oh crap. And that's pretty much what was said. So you you, 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 you you felt and heard a round go by your head, and then what happened? Oh no, there, that was, I mean, there was rounds going over my head, because I had the little, what we call chicken, chicken plate, uh -huh. which is just like a thin piece of armor up, so I was like poking my head behind it, and, because they, what they were doing is they were using these grape huts, they're basically, like, like you know the thing you shred cheese on, with uh -huh. a, a cheese grater? Uh -huh with like one foot thick mud walls that are inside of that, using that as a fighting position, which, smart idea. Uh -huh. 
So they're firing at you from there. And then uh, you didn't bring your helmet this time, but you've brought your helmet yeah. in the past. And where and where, what happened? You got just the round hit the front rod of my helmet, hit my skull, and came around and out the back of the helmet. And then immediately you went down. I slumped over from what my medic tells me into the vehicle. He's thinking because it happened so quickly that I was sleeping or something. Because like I said, it was a crack of dawn when we started yeah. off. So it was like, Joe, what the hell? He feels bad about it uh -huh. now, but he saved my life. So. And then uh, I think you had mentioned to the class that um, as they medevaced you out, your the. Uh, it took a while, apparently. I mean, I wasn't obviously awake then, or all there. Like so, as soon as that bullet hit my skull. You, but the rest of your ODA thought you were dead when you when you or you're you're gonna die. Oh for yeah, sure. when 100%. they got me when they got me finally got me back to Kandahar Airfield, CAF. Uh -huh. That's when they were like they said their goodbyes and they were like doing the whole. And my, my wife had because they were on the command was on the phone with my wife saying, "Hey, he's been gravely injured and uh -huh. doesn't look good." So she's like, can you have him baptized and all that? So they were doing the last rites, the priest and everything, like as if I wasn't coming back. Uh -huh. Little did they know. Yeah. <laughs> so he went, so, he, so uh, how long were you in a coma? A month. Here's some pictures. Who's this guy right here? So this is you. That's my uh, colonel and CSM, Mark Tebow. That's what that member I was saying. They were saying their goodbyes. Yeah. That's in Kandahar. That oh. picture. Oh, I see. So this so is a, a picture similar to that one in the same location with my whole team around my bed, uh -huh. saying their goodbyes because they were saying, "Hey, doesn't look good." So at this point right here, your 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 ODA teammates all saw you. They looked at you in this state, and the doctor's pretty much gone. Like he's yeah. say your last goodbyes. He's gone. He's not gonna make it. And then. This picture that's taken right here with President Obama. Oh, that's at Walter Reed. Walter Reed is located. Washington, or Virginia, to and the, uh, Maryland. And who else is in the picture? Obama, my mom, my son, my wife, her friend, Chantel. Our, they were, uh, she was a good friend from back in Florida. And then uh, I cut, this part got cut off, but uh, this is from President Obama, right? Joe, yeah. thank you for your extraordinary service to our nation, uh, President Obama. Not an Obama fan, but it yeah. means a lot that the president comes in. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is, this at the ceremony, this is your, this is? Yeah, my daughter. And, uh, this, and this is at the uh, uh, ceremony. Yeah, so they held a ceremony for me, because obviously that time when they gave me the Purple Heart and I thought I was going to die, I wasn't there. Uh -huh. So they later on came back and my unit did a whole thing and made sure to do it right. So that way I could remember the ceremony, which I think I showed your other class that video of it. Yeah. Up at Palo Alto. Right on. Uh, any quick questions that you guys have before they head out? And again, I know this, you didn't sign up for military history, but like getting to meet one of our national heroes that literally took a bullet for the that. USA. But we that's that's a fair bullet for the country. Yeah. They, 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 so the national heroes generally will say they're not national heroes, but he's a national hero um, in the minds of everybody. But you know. Um, so, a, a, any questions? Yes. What was your first deployment like? Were you in Afghanistan in the first deployment as well? Yeah. It was the classic, as I call it, Special Forces mission meeting we were living off. Because not everybody, it's not Hollywood. Not I mean, a lot of them are on big bases, and it's not really a deployment. They're, they got KFCs and things like that, so don't let them lie to you. It was rough. They just didn't have mama there with them, so. But I mean, it's just, I mean, we were living in a small village doing what they call, we called at the time the BSL mission meaning village stability operations, so we were pushing out to remote locations. And it really pushed me as a new SF guy on my first deployment with the team, where it was like, hey, build a base. And especially as the 11 or the 18 Charlie, that was my job to get all the logistics there to build a base from scratch. And it was cool, because I got to use my training, you know, and dig in the tool chest and see what I could come up with. Um, I've, uh, yeah, go ahead, question? I 
I don't remember anything from it. They do call it, the neuropsychologists call it confabulations, which just means a made up memory. It's a fancy term for it. But so basically like there was a time where I could have sworn I saw like somebody in there. They're like, now that, that didn't happen, Joe. I'm like, hmm. Um, so th this is where, where I'm going to kind of make a push it back? No, move into uh, financial literacy, which is their class. Oh, okay. But a, a future guest speaker is Stephen Munitonis, who's videoing over here, who trains, d does the training of Special Forces, Navy SEALs, and he supplies, uh, he's engineered equipment for Special Forces training, SEALs training, but also for recovery and stuff. Absolutely. Um, so it's Katsu. So Stephen over there is the CEO and co-founder of 